We hope you enjoy this episode of the Modern Arizona podcast. But first, an important message for our listeners. Hello, this is Billy Tarasio, owner of Modern Law. We're a family law firm in Phoenix, Arizona with offices throughout the state. We have attorneys who can help you with every aspect of your family law case. We also have a legal clinic run by students for those of you who need budget-friendly resources, and we have lawyers who've been practicing for more than 20 years. Collectively, Modern Law has more than 200 years of legal experience. So when you hire Modern Law, you're not just getting an attorney, you're getting a team. If you live in Arizona and need representation, call us today. That's 480-649-2905 or visit us at mymodernlaw.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Modern Arizona Podcast. Today I am joined by a Chandler parent, Mr. Jordan Harstad. Did I say that correctly? Yeah. Um, who is here sharing his story. He lost a son to suicide after some pretty severe bullying. He did everything he could to protect his son, including getting police and schools involved And ultimately, it did not work. He sued the Chandler School District. At this point, that lawsuit has been dismissed, and we are going to get the whole story. Jordan, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Can you tell us about your son, Andrew? Uh, My son, Andrew Harstad, was my firstborn. Um, Had him at a young age, so him and I, you know, Got along great. I was the coach. He was the quarterback. I, I had the pleasure of coaching him in youth sports and flag football and then on uh, to, to sports beyond that for the better part of a decade. Um, so him and I did everything together. Um, went to Disneyland three, four times a year. Uh, some of the best moments of my life, uh, watching him kind of grow up and develop uh, into the man that he became. Uh, still the best memories I will likely ever have. Um, and even this event can't take that away from me. So Andrew was and is amazing. Andrew's big brother, right? He is big brother. He's the oldest of uh, two. He has a younger brother that's roughly 18 months younger than him at the time. Okay. Um, Andrew entered his freshman year at Hamilton And this is when kind of all the problems started, right? Uh, The the escalation of problems, yeah. So Andrew uh, played tackle football um, during COVID for a private league, GYFL. It was a great experience. He decided he wanted to play tackle football for uh, Hamilton High School. They were renowned for it. They were a great team. It was something Andrew wanted to aspire to. So even before his freshman year, um, they had, you know, summer league, summer ball. So it's, you know, he enjoyed that. And then the beginning of his freshman year while on campus, you know, coming out of all the summer practices and summer football, you know, preseason type games, uh, things started to go pretty sideways pretty quick. So he was he was 14 then playing summer league with the Hamilton football team? Correct, yeah. All ages, you know, from seniors down to him, incoming freshmen? Yeah, they tried to segregate them or separate them based on uh, age and or position, uh, but more or less it was kind of commingled between freshmen through senior. Um, Andrew was a quarterback, so a lot of his, you know, uh, practice items would be in the quarterback room or or learning plays uh, that were specific to his position. It's unusual that you would have a quarterback of a football team experience bullying. I ask myself that every single day. Um, six foot tall, long blonde hair, bright blue eyes, brilliant, athletic, funny. Everyone loved him. It does not discriminate. It does not discriminate. Bullying is something that, and mental health and the things that our kids are going through is something that every single parent, no matter how popular your child is, should pay attention to. And that's why you telling your story is so important. Yeah. 
So how did Andrew find himself in this conflict? Or what, what happened when the bullying started? When the bullying started, um, you know, Andrew, Andrew wasn't sure if it was part of the, the high school ecosystem, you know, coming out of middle school and, and being, you know, the new kid on campus or the youngest uh, group of students on campus. So he wasn't sure what was to be expected or what had kind of elevated beyond that. Um, you know, August of, of 21, which during his freshman year, things escalated. He was, you know, he texted me, help, help, help. Yeah. You know, found his location on his phone, raced down the street and, and saw, you know, four students, uh, apparently from the same high school, forcing Andrew into the back of a pickup truck with another friend. Uh, I immediately stopped it, you know, pulled Andrew and his friend out of that situation, reported it to the police, reported the school. Six days later, Andrew was in class with these same upperclassmen, forced out of class, escorted into the restroom, um, what, what happened in there, I, I couldn't tell you, but I was luckily, uh, another student walked in and started asking questions and the group kind of disbanded again, no follow-up, no real summary of what happened um, from the school or the district. And, and it continued to escalate from there, um, fights at football games, police arresting other students, really, again, no follow-up or or no sharing of anything with the parents because I think the district's policy is when they deal with punishments, they they don't have to share that with the involved parties, only the student that, you know, was getting the punishment. Um, countless police reports, uh, sit down meetings with the assistant principal, um, the resource officer, also a Chandler Unified Police Officer. I mean, there was nothing off limits. Communication was wide open, first name basis cell phones, email addresses, uh, and still it, it didn't appear that, you know, anything was able to be done to, to prevent it, to stop it, to reduce it. Was this hazing? Was this happening to all of the freshman team? Like, why were they targeting Andrew? I don't know if I would consider it hazing or anything specific to, you know, the sport that he was playing or the grade that he was in. I really can't identify why it was, was specific to my son, Andrew. Okay. Um, that part I'll, I'll probably never know. But there were four boys, right, that attempted to kidnap him in the truck. You stopped them. Were these, is that right? Yeah, there were four. Were these four boys also on the football team? Uh, I don't believe they were on the football team, but they were fellow classmates, uh, either juniors or seniors at the time. Okay. So it wasn't necessarily related to football. It was somehow these juniors and seniors had decided to target him. Do you know if those boys were part of something like the Gilbert goons? I don't know. Um, I, I haven't really tracked the names or anything too often just because of, you know, the state that I'm in from losing my son. I try to avoid, you know, online threads or, or media or newspapers as much as I can. Uh, I couldn't say one way or another. I don't believe so, though. They attempted to kidnap him. They physically removed him from a classroom. They physically assaulted him. And you reported all of these incidents to both police and the school. Correct. At one point, you got an injunction against harassment. Correct. I went down to the Chandler courthouse found out the process of, of what was necessary. We were still living kind of in a, in a post COVID legal world. So it was rather complicated you had to sign up in the police station and get a link to a WebEx meeting later on that day. And Andrew and I sat there and told our story and the judge granted a, an injunction against harassment against uh, one of the fellow students um, in one of his classes. Okay, and can I ask, what that injunction required did it require like a certain number of feet that he not be within or during the injunction process i did have to disclose they were fellow students so mm -hmm. the judge said that the school had to make a best effort to keep them separated segregated and apart that was it nothing yeah, he, 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 he so... asked for no contact um you know online or anything like that but as far as a, a foot or distance requirement on the injunction that wasn't included because they were both 
at the same school and sharing one class at the time when the injunction was granted. Okay, so then you were asking the school to help enforce this injunction, right? Correct. Yeah, I, I initiated um, the email to the assistant principal with the injunction attached as a PDF file. I explained why, what, when. I provided suggestions on, on how to best enforce it uh, at certain schools. You know, there's different lunch periods, A and B and things like that. We were always the the family and, and the student, Andrew, offering to kind of bend their schedule and sit with other people and not spend time with the friends that he did have because he he wanted to to feel safe and remain safe while on campus. This is a ongoing theme that I hear is when there is instances of bullying, schools are often putting the onus on the victim to change their schedule or change their lunch instead of having the consequence be for the bully. Yeah, I would I would agree. Um, we were both the offense and the defense. Um, you know, be, between schedule changes and initiating communication and contact with the school, with the district, with the police department, with the resource officer, we always felt that it was kind of in our court to continue to pressure them to to enforce, you know, a legal injunction amongst other things, which was very tiring because at the same time we're we're trying to boost Andrew up, build him up, make sure he's protected, make sure he knows we love him, and 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 trying to resolve those issues beyond you know just the stuff that was occurring at school. I can imagine he was terrified. There had been multiple incidents where he was completely victimized. I can't imagine he felt safe going to school. Um, he didn't. I mean, that was his, his, he would cry every morning. Um, I'd say, Andrew, you know, you've got a lot of absences. I understand the situation, but we're doing everything we can for you. Uh, I even reached out to the school district, uh, asked them to move him to Chandler online no engagement, really no response. Um, I'm not sure that email ever was responded to. The most recent one was only a few days before his passing too. Okay, so this, the the incidents started at the beginning of the school year, like August, 2021? Yeah, the first major incident was August 14th, um, 2021. The, day before his younger brother's birthday. So that was something that will always stick with me. And at what point did you decide, I got to get him out of this school? We tried after the first incident to change school schedules or go to COA. Uh, we were ensured that you know he would be protected. That wasn't necessary. One of the biggest things that Andrew was worried about was continuing to play football for a high school program, um, there's a lot of rules in the state of Arizona and, and countrywide that if you move a campus or a district or change high schools, you know, once football has started, you essentially have to sit out or, or have to wait or, you know, red shirt from, from a high school perspective. So he, that was top on his priority list. That was the number one thing he wanted to be was, was, was play in the NFL. And, you know, I, I didn't want to take that from him because of these issues either. It's a really good point. If your child is an athlete and you are trying to get away from bullying and you change schools, there are some significant consequences to that athlete. Yep. At some point, Andrew began being sexually exploited. There was an incident where Andrew felt very alone, um, you know, not that everyone had his best interests. So we often allowed friends to to stay at our house to, you know, watch Netflix with him and go get in and out and, you know, do, do fun things like that to support him while in our house. Uh, this incident during a sleepover, you know, some supposed friends gained access to his phone, uh, extracted some photos from that phone by taking pictures of it with their phone, and somehow those photos ended up circulating uh, around the school, 
and around the football team in the locker room and PE. And, and, you know, it was just kind of insult to injury to him that, you know, if not just for the bowling, that now he's, he's got to deal with, with this um, and still continue top priority play football. It, it made it really hard. And, and because of that incident, uh, I made quite a few phone calls and in-person visits to the high school spoke with the assistant principal about changing his schedule. We're moving him from a, a class called Football Academy. Football Academy is a mandatory class for for any high school athlete. Um, they come in early in the morning. They do weightlifting. Um, they talk about football strategy and plays. And the school was extremely reluctant to allow me to remove him from this this Football Academy class, which, because of the photo, was was a source of the, a lot of the harassment and the circulation of, of the images and things like that. Uh, I did finally get him removed, but their only um, kind of olive branch was he had to take PE instead, which wasn't much different than the environment from Football Academy. A lot of shared areas, shared locker rooms, a lot of the same kids that he had seen. So that was that was kind of a dead end. That was that was very frustrating to me, and that was you know one of the last instances and issues we had had with with Andrew, and you know it kind of deflated him to see that. You know, we couldn't even extract him from that environment, even with every phone call or sit down meeting we had. When did the sleepover incident happen? The sleepover incident happened February 23rd, February 24th. The sleepover was was over that night. Uh, it was a, a Wednesday night to a Thursday morning. Okay. Um, and we really didn't know it had happened in, until it was too late because it's it's not like, you know, they knew his pin or unlocked um, and texted it to someone else. So the evidence was pretty obvious. They took a photo of it from their own phone and started circulating. And it, it took a, a few days for it to get back to Andrew. Um, you know, that was reported to the school and Chandler police within 48 hours. I really can't recall any follow up or progressive solution that they offered to us. Thankfully, spring break kind of rolled right after that. We hoped things were, were going to kind of settle down and people forget about it and they'd move on to, to, to something else. But you know, going back to school early April, um, it had only escalated. And that's when we, you know, really tried to shift his schedule around and get him pulled out of those classes where, you know, the people were harassing him about what they had seen and the, and the photos on their phone. So the original four, one of one of them you had an injunction against. Did his behavior change? Yes and no. Um, in a public environment, it did. He he wouldn't look at Andrew. He would kind of walk the other way. But even after the escalations, injunctions, and police reports, there were still physical altercations. One of my favorite photos of Andrew um, is his Max Preps photo, photo online, which Max Preps is, you know, for high school sports and athletes. Um, he, he's in all his high school football gear, his Speedflex helmet that he was so proud of. And if you zoom into to his eye, he's got a black guy from this, this same student. So it, it just didn't stop. So that happened after you got the injunction. Yep. After there was already a police report about this child trying to kidnap your child. Was he arrested? I've never received any follow up. I was never provided any status updates as far as suspensions, arrests, future investigations, nothing, not after dozens and dozens and dozens of attempts. Was a specific police report made to Chandler PD? Many. <laughs> and they just, they didn't follow up with you or what did they tell you? Uh, that it was being looked at and investigated. Um, offhand, I have four or five right here. I never really had any follow-up from, from any of them. Um, yeah, it's for someone or a parent that thinks they're, they're spending every ounce of energy or resource that they have to keep their child safe, involving the police, filing reports, sit-downs, injunctions, emails, it, it, it didn't seem to matter. This is Billy Tarasio, owner of Win Without Law School and Modern Law. Win Without Law School is a program that operates nationally and helps people who are representing themselves or who just need more help. 
If you are in a family court case and you're feeling confused, you need direction, you need help figuring out questions to procedural or strategic issues, Win Without Law School can help. At Win Without Law School, you've got two experienced attorneys, me and my partner, Julie LeBenz, who can guide you through the court process and help you troubleshoot your case. You've got access to courses, planners, checklists, and live Q&A. Our live Q&A is where you can get help from us and your community. We also have a closed Facebook group just for members where you all can share your experience, share your pleadings, get advice and mentorship. Join us today at winwithoutlawschool.com. That's winwithoutlawschool.com. You've got so many crimes happening against your son in a very short period of time. Uh, in May was when he took his life. Yep. May 16th, 2022. Worst day of my life. I relive it every single day. Yeah, I can't imagine the horror as yeah. a parent. And to, to add to that, it was, I think, a week before his freshman year was over. So the hope was, you know, get him through finals, get him out of this, this school, let him reset over summer break. And now every finals week, every high school graduation, we see all of the friends and family, you know, signing to other colleges and recruitment letters and final exam, you know, gift baskets and all that. And it's just a reminder every single year that he's not here. You sued Chandler School District and Hamilton High School and I think the SRO officer for wrongful death and negligence and that lawsuit has been dismissed I, I, of I think it was just the school district which included the high school but the the sra was not on there okay um and one of the things that you are working on is changing policies surrounding how school districts handle bullying because Andrew's story unfortunately is not unique. Yeah, we're, we're we're meeting with every legislator and power that be to if not for us then then someone in the future Andrew's story is earth shattering to us but it's not unique to even just our community, I, I think at the time Andrew passed uh, in, in May of 2022, I, I believe there was five or six other students alone within the same school district. Um, so we're we're trying we're trying to change that. Uh, we're, we're trying to allow the law to support what we're trying to do. The law right now is very 1970s. You know, suicide was looked at as a sin. It was looked at as a person's individual choice. Uh, and now as we begin to understand, uh, you know, mental health, mental health awareness and, and how it comes to be a little bit better, we need, you know, those that are with, with our, our children, you know, six, seven, eight hours a day, five days a week, seven, eight, nine months out of the year to be, you know, as vested in the safety and the well-being and the mental health progression to them as, as we would like them to be instead of being more or less protected by this this law that says, you know, oh, if your son was here, you could proceed with a lawsuit, but unfortunately, he passed of suicide, so you're no longer able to, and that, that just doesn't make sense to me. The Chandler School District, in their defense, claimed that your son had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, had pre-existing mental health challenges, had previous suicide threats or ideation, and had been in a psychiatric hospital. 
Do you want to address those claims by Chandler? I would like to. I would simply phrase it as, as cause and effect. This didn't appear out of thin air. Yes, Andrew had his challenges. I think back to when I was 15 and didn't really know who I was, what I wanted to do, where I would end up. You know, my, my brain was still very much maturing. So, you know, those those decisions or, or choices or, or, you know, verbiage that Andrew had had at that age, that, that doesn't change the fact that those that are with our children, our young adults for that long need to nurture that. You know, when, when Andrew was struggling with being afraid to go to school, I personally called the truancy officer. I have a voicemail from the truancy officer. I said, I can't imagine how many parents have called you asking for help. You know, I, I what resources do you have available to us to support us to get Andrew to school to keep him safe? And he said, unfortunately, Andrew doesn't fit in a category where we can really help you on that one. So we 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 sought out even, you know, you hear truancy. I think most parents they they don't want to absorb that or they don't want to use that as a benefit for their child. But we we took every angle every possibility, every pathway, and really. Another. At what point did you get Andrew into therapy? He had been speaking to a counselor um, for, for about a year. Um, Before you know, the we, freshman year. Pardon? Before his freshman year. Yeah, he, he had been meeting with a counselor before his freshman year, just to promote well-being and you know grow as a is a is a proper teenager during you know lockdown and covid and and kind of you know make sure he was he was on the right track and and that was a regular check in and you know that's not anything abnormal nowadays and we All wanted right. to make sure we gave him resources to talk to that weren't just his his you know two boring parents i think as any teenager would say and he, we wanted him to have an out that was professional and, and someone that could could make a change and yeah okay and when did he get inpatient treatment it was shortly after the photo incident so it was right around you know march more or less march of 2022 so right after the photo incident you know he just struggling with self-worth you know, very sad, very disappointed that, you know, even even these two people, these two classmates or, or friends that he had trusted to, to to stay over and have a great time, even that kind of got flipped around on him. So he did go inpatient for a few days at a facility up in Scottsdale for, you know, treatment and, and monitoring. We We should talk about this because the sexual exploitation that Andrew experienced, photo, naked photos being passed around. It's usually thought of as something that only happens to girls. And that's simply not true. And it's incredibly common, but devastating. Yeah, it's with social media and photos that you know disappear after a certain amount of time I, I think the the youth today or the teenagers today are they're becoming too normalized to it and then they don't understand when you know it's it's maybe gone too far um so they don't they don't know when to speak up i, I think andrew even hesitated telling me that uh -huh. what, what had happened and explaining to me that you know what what he thought occurred and and you know the, the, he still had his phone no one had broken into it or mm -hmm. there was no you know unknown text messages or anything like that and so th they're scared that you know to to kind of speak up or even speak to their parents about it because it's also a touchy subject once that occurs oh gosh right how horrible nobody wants to talk to their parents about it and there are countless stories about kids being exploited in this way and then committing suicide. Like, and I think 
I think I am only just now understanding how these these phones can be weapons that our children aren't getting enough education or monitoring they can't handle it and it's 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 all of them right it's 14 year olds that are sharing things they shouldn't share and taking pictures they shouldn't take it's just it's a dangerous weapon yeah you know phones nowadays location sharing you know strangers popping up that claim to be someone you know or, or a friend or a family friend that's you know supposed to pick you up or, or meet you somewhere uh you know we we monitored andrew's you know online presence pretty well i mean pretty much every day mm -hmm. and, and i know you know a lot of parents don't have the time or the tools to do that as much as we did but even with you know kind of full-on monitoring and tracking and location you know like I, I mentioned earlier on it maybe saved his life in the ski mask incident but you know it's it, you it's, did it's not hard. mention ski masks yeah, in 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 the truck incident when he was being forced into the vehicle they all had ski masks on and that was this is not the first time that we are hearing about teens terrorizing the community or terrorizing other teens in ski masks. We heard about it with the Gilbert Goons. We heard about it with the Morrison Ranch kids. Now we're hearing about it with kids in Chandler. This issue is pervasive. And, and this incident was back in August of 21. So this is, you know, kind of before all these stories started to to pop up in a line and, and, and share, you know, common attributes. Yeah. I've, I've, he, Andrew texted me out with some friends, help, help, help. Couldn't he, I didn't even have time to get more information. I didn't need more information. I, I pulled up where his location was and I'll admit it. I probably ran five, 10 stop signs and lights to get down there. Cause the most important thing to me was the safety of my son. And had I been even, you know, five seconds later than that, they probably would have been long gone in, in that truck with, you know, who who knows what was going to happen. Um, but I got there just in time and wedged in front of the truck and demanded they released him. And we and drove as know far these... as we could to the East Valley and just kind of sat there for an hour while we were catching our breath. So. And you you don't know if these kids have terrorized other kids. I, I don't know any instances or, or specific, you know, reports or I did know the kids well enough um, to to really follow up or fall back on that. But yeah, it was back in 2021, this, this behavior was occurring. You never got an answer from Chandler police as to why they didn't move forward with some sort of urgency. I never really got any follow up on uh, any of the incidences. Um, you know, I think the response from the district tried to to say that I, uh, you know, was was an uncaring father and did not follow up on the photo incident on the phone. And they said that I never met with the detective and never followed up. And I made sure to share a voicemail with them of the detective saying, I'm sorry, Jordan, we forgot to schedule your appointment. I never sent you the address. Can we follow up now? So even with the phone incident, after talking to a detective, after finding the police report, I sat there waiting to go on site for them to look at the phone. And it, it never happened. And I made sure to save that voicemail because the, the, the attack on me was, well, you, you never followed through. Who said that to you? I, I think that was one of the legal responses when I filed the initial lawsuit was that, you know, I didn't do my part as his father to follow through on that case of the photos. What advice do you have for parents whose children are being bullied? Hmm. I hate to sound so clerical, but document everything. 
I know that's not the top priority, you know, the safety of your kid is, but document everything. Find whatever hoop you have to jump through to follow the process and the protocol and make sure that occurs. Um, and then be vocal. Don't sit there waiting for a response, waiting for a follow up, waiting for a one on one meeting, waiting for something to happen. You, you need to own the offense and the defense of, of the safety of, of your kids, even at school, um, even with bullying, because. You know, I, I can't imagine. Living every life every day as I do now is it's every it's not even every hour a day every minute is the most difficult minute you could ever imagine and now had i also had to live every minute like that and know that i did not do everything that i possibly could humanly available to me to protect my son you know i that's a whole nother you know realm that i, I don't even think I, I could make it out of so what would you like to see schools do differently? Seems like there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. I would like for the schools to reach out to those of us that have lived this, that have experienced this, because we have real world tangibles that we can share with you that, that will improve the process. You know, there's there's been stories about facilities being built to to treat students and, and all of that. Um, I, I would have loved to have been a resource to help, to guide, to provide feedback. Um, I really want this process to be more open and not so complex and convoluted that a parent that is, you know, trying everything they can to keep their child safe now also has to navigate form A-1-7, submit it on this date, meet on this date, scan on these. It's, you know, e even through that process, it's, it's the, the effort needs to be spent on, on the child, on the student, and it needs to be easier for, for parents and families to, to follow through with. I feel that it's complex on purpose maybe to, to, you know, kind of slow down the process and, and less, you know, red tape, um, make it harder to submit the things that you need to. And I want the schools to just to, to listen. It's, you know, you feel that government response or government entities are years behind or years late after after what, you know, kids and society needs. I feel that we're we're way behind it right now. Um, you know, this this occurred two years ago and I still don't think, you know, it, it would have been enough. Well right. Nothing's changed. It's been two years. Nothing's changed. We have the same systems and problems in place. And the school districts, as far as I can tell, have been really silent. Silent. I, I personally haven't heard anything, but you know, as as far as student wellness, I, I do appreciate that I, I've seen some investments in, you know, see something, say something, suicide hotline. You know, we're all looking out for each other, but I do also need them to understand that for for someone that's struggling, it, it's going to be incredibly difficult to reference an email or a flyer that was you know posted six months ago or you follow through with the process they really the schools need to be on the offense of this not on the defense they the schools need to initiate they need to reach out they need to follow up and follow through because a lot of these these kids and students that are struggling you know they're in a mind space where they're they're not going to ask for help they're 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 not going to have enough effort or energy to do that and they're they're waiting on those resources to come to them to help them and that's you know, that's one of the biggest things we learned with Andrew was we, we had to come to him. You know, he, he wasn't, he, he barely had enough energy to make it through the day. And so we really had to initiate everything we could with him, checking in on him, taking him places, you know. So. My hope is that parents not only listen 
to Andrew's story, but share Andrew's story with their children. If your children are teens, they, your teens need to be aware that this is happening. They need to think about who am I? Am I, am I participating in bullying? Am I the victim of bullying? What am I seeing in school? Like they need our help to make sense of it. They're in a bad world right now. Yeah. Anything else that you would like parents to know? Or anything else about Andrew that you want people to know? At his service was well over a thousand kids. I don't think I can name off a thousand people that I've probably met in my entire lifetime. So to see that and that support from the community at the time was amazing. Um, a lot of those friends, you know, you're you're probably graduating pretty soon here, and we'd we'd love to hear from you. Uh, those families that I, I coached youth football for 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 ten plus years. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Don't be afraid. I know it's a, an awkward topic. And, you know, when you think about it, you'd probably rather just kind of put your head down and walk the other way. Uh, we, don't, we don't want that. We, we'd love to hear from you all. And uh, we're really excited to see what, you know, your families are doing moving forward with, you know, enrolling in college and committing to different schools. I'm, I'm proud but sad at the same time. It's 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 a conflicting feeling to see that success, but to know that you know my my son Andrew's not there with them. And so we'd we'd love to hear from you all. Thank you so much, Jordan, for coming on the show and for sharing your story and Andrew's story. Yeah, thank you. I want his name to, you know, not not pass because he doesn't exist here on this planet. Um, He's one of the best people I've I've ever known in my entire life, and I'll continue to use his name. His name is my middle name, so every time I, I see it written anywhere, it gives me a little smile, so let, it, let him live on. Thanks so much for listening to the Modern Arizona Podcast. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, make sure to download it, like it, leave a review, and share it with your friends. If you know someone who would be a good guest or you would like to be on the Modern Arizona podcast, make sure to give us an email or reach out to us at mymodernlaw.com.